G'day folks, welcome to this uh, third video in this Learning GOSS slash Rules Primer series for the Grand Operational Simulation series. This video covers the combat phase and it starts on page 32 here and my recommendation is that you quickly review the combat phase sequence of play just to get a sense of how things flow. This begins with a tactical assault designation segment, replacements, fire support segment, this is sort of artillery, air support, naval gunfire support, attacker status adjustments, this is where you can make adjustments, remove markers that exceed your limitations, then you do ground assault and then artillery shift marker removal. I'll run through these in uh, this video. It begins with that tactical assault designation phase. So, you know, I, I mentioned prepared assaults earlier is the best way to assault uh, a hex, but if you get to this point and you realize you want to make a hurried assault, you can place a tactical assault marker on a hex. Now, these are, as I said, hurried assaults, sort of rushed assaults. Uh, it is basically one hex to one hex. You can't combine tactical assaults with other uh, assaults taking place and it suffers some penalties. Now the, the limitation or the concern here with some of the older titles in the GOSS series is they don't have these tactical assault markers. This is a feature of the revised rules. I have Atlantic Wall, so I can borrow these markers from Atlantic Wall, but if you don't have another title in the GOSS series, you might want to just use bingo chips or some of the markers, create your own perhaps to designate TA um, activated units. From there, uh, the first kind of step in the commencement of combat is the, the resolution, designation resolution of fire support missions. And there are three types of fire support missions. There is ground support, which uses air points. It's basically your air support being brought in to attack, uh, to conduct these fire support missions on targeted hex. Uh, there is artillery barrage missions that use their barrage factors as fire support points, and there's naval gunfire support, which uses naval gunfire support points as fire support mission. Now these are kind of resolved in a similar way. Uh, they convert their sort of points into fire support points, but they're resolved separately. You don't combine these three types of fire support. And indeed, there is a whole sub-segment section where you resolve them in different orders. The active side declares and conducts their air ground support missions first. The inactive player conducts their fire support in, in separate steps. And then the active player declares their naval gun fire support, then declares and conducts their artillery support, and then conducts those previously declared naval gun fire support. So there's this special little sequence that you have to follow when resolving these fire supports, uh, fire support missions. Each mission is resolved by adhering to these nine steps. I'll provide a bit of an overview and then I'll go through the details. So first of all, you need a spotting unit. Um, I'll talk about that in a moment. You then declare, the inactive player declares if they have um, eligible DRMs to apply to the barrage. Uh, you then select the target hex, uh, determine mission capacity, calculate the number of volleys, Determine dice roll modifiers for that, determine the result of volleys, implement results, and then check for ammunition depletion. As I mentioned, you start with a spotting unit. Now you need to be able to spot either the enemy unit or a population feature in their hex. If you can't see the unit, but you can see these population features, you suffer uh, this unobserved uh, dice roll modifier, which is I think a negative four dice roll modifier. Generally, though, you'll be able to see the target. Um, there are limits to uh, what spotters can see in terms of number of enemy targets. So a battalion size unit can spot two separate target hexes. A company size unit can spot one target hex. Okay, so you need to think about friendly units that can actually see the targets. And, and um, ground support, artillery missions, and naval gunfire missions all require those spotters. There are some... Uh, Rules for air spotting covered in this section. Some scenarios may um, provide for that, that allowance. Now it's worth uh, noting that there are sometimes limitations to the number of uh, missions. So down here you can only conduct one artillery mission target per combat phase. Ground support and naval gunfire support missions will vary with the mission capacity, which I'll talk about in just a moment. Um, but you can't conduct, over here, you can't conduct a ground support and naval gunfire support mission into the same target hex during sub-segment 2. It must be one or the other. This is the inactive player um, returning fire. 
Uh, so there's various kind of limitations in these missions and um, what you can do. So here we go to the, the mission capacity and there's light, medium or heavy capacity missions. The difference principally revolves around how the target is spotted, how well observed the target is. The better the observation, the more fire support you can bring to the target. So an unobserved mission, for example, is always light capacity. If a spotter is company sized, it's, it's, uh, it's light capacity. And that limits the number of fire support you're allowed. You're not, not allowed ground support, for example, um, on a light capacity mission. If you have a battalion sized unit uh, who can observe the, 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 um, the target unit or a population feature, you can make it a medium capacity unit, which allows you to bring in more fire support missions. And if you have a battalion sized unit in prepared assault mode or if they're in a sort of uh, fortification, then you can make it a heavy capacity unit uh, mission, which enables you to bring a lot of uh, fire support missions to that target hex. So the better you are able to observe the target, the more artillery you can bring, the more, sorry, not just artillery, the more fire support you can bring in terms of both ground support, artillery, and naval gunfire support. Now the rules cover some modifiers to that. They cover requirements for formations to participate in missions. They cover um, range requirements for artillery, for various naval uh, units and well, air, air points, which don't have specific ranges, um, but they may specific may may specify areas of operations. Then we get to uh, perhaps probably the most difficult section, and that's regarding fire support mission points and and volleys. And again, this is probably the area that was most foreign to me that you need to read through carefully, um, particularly with regards to. Um, volleys in a mission and mission points and converting all that kind of stuff. The key thing to take away from this whole section is that you are calculating fire support mission points from your fire support missions, but they're calculated differently for air, naval and artillery missions. For artillery missions, each point of barrage factor that you bring to that mission uh, equals one fire support uh, mission point and uh, yep um, where you have volleys okay the number of volleys is equal to the total number of mission points fire support mission points divided by eight so if you bring or here's the example 36 barrage factors you'll have a fire support mission with five volleys four with a value of eight so four separate volleys four different resolutions and one with a value of four um, yes, so that's, <laughs> if that sounds confusing, read through that very carefully. Then there are various sort of rules for participation of flak units and tank destroy units, worth skimming those, um, splitting fire, various modifiers, heavy artillery. Okay, so intensive fire, it's worth paying attention to this. You can designate intensive fire to create additional volleys, but that... Uh, where are the rules here? That expends ammunition points for each added intensive fire volley. What does this mean? This is where you really want to concentrate fire on a hex, on a very important hex, and you're willing to expend these relatively rare uh, or valuable ammunition points to really pour that additional fire. It will, yes, exhaust your ammunition points. You can only add one intensive fire volley for each original eight point volley in um, the mission. Okay, that's for artillery. For naval gunfire support, naval gunfire support I think it's called, or naval ground support, uh, each type of naval unit has a specific number of fire support mission points that they bring to their, their fire support. And then you've got air support, and each air point assigned equals two fire support missions. Each mission is one volley. Okay. Once you've kind of, and, and they're all resolved, as I said, separately. They all, you, you do, as I said, gun, naval gunfire support, ground support, artillery support in different sections. You work out the missions separately. Okay. I know I'm going to have this page open 
and checking through how this is all resolved. There is a summary on the barrage table to summarize some of these key uh, elements and differences. So once you've determined the number of volleys and the strength of each volley, you will determine the dice roll modifiers that apply to each volley. And there are over a dozen different types of modifiers. Um, I'll summarize these, but I won't go through the detail. So there are terrain modifiers. There are defensive work modifiers. There are armor modifiers. There are unit density modifiers based on number of steps. And there are other conditions. I mentioned the unobserved target minus four earlier, night turn, vantage point modifiers, uh, strap mode, if the target is in strap mode, nibble of a bonus, um, uh, nibble of a mass shock effect. Uh, I believe this is a battleship fire support mission modifier. Yep. Uh, and then weather modifiers as well. So apply and, and some modifiers, um, look, read through the section carefully. There's various, various modifiers that apply under different circumstances. Um, yeah, and you basically apply those to your volleys. Once you've determined the number of volleys and the modifiers that apply to your volleys and the strength of your volleys, you apply mission resolution. You roll a d10, add the fire support point strength of that volley to the die roll result, apply the net fire support mission dice roll modifiers, a maximum of plus or minus 10 to that volley, cross-reference the fire support value, with uh, with the table and determine um, the result. Now again, there have been some changes between in the rules since the publication of Wacht am um, Rhein. So I have taken my fire support table from Atlantic War and just photocopied it. So if you can find a copy of this, get a photocopy. Um, here you can see various modifiers that apply. Um, Basically, uh, you will try to cause uh, numerical hits on uh, the target after the results have been determined, total the number of numerical and what are called AS or artillery shift hits, uh, and the defender then applies the results. Artillery shifts, I've been trying to wrap my head around this, they are effectively, I think of them as sort of barrage factors, oh, not barrage factors, uh, sort of um, units in the hex being shocked by the artillery, which has an effect on um, ground support and other factors. So, the resolution may tell you to place these artillery shift markers, and the units marked with these artillery shift markers receive unfavorable column shifts. They are reduce adjacent defender column shifts. I'll talk about that in a moment. They uh, cannot cause a step loss when an enemy retreats into a hex adjacent to them. So they're keeping their heads down. They lose their uh, combat reserve status. So you remove the marker. Um, yeah, so it has this sort of short term units in the hex keeping their heads down. Once you've placed those markers as called for by the uh, fire support table, you then resolve uh, numerical hits. These can be step losses or retreats. Follow the instructions here for applying those step losses and um, uh, yeah, basically you apply step loss, then you can make a, if you have still have steps to resolve, a proficiency rating check using the defensive uh, PR. This is when you know, they, they're caught on. If you pass, you can remain in the hex. If you fail, uh, you, can, you have to remove the hack designation of the target units, apply another artillery shift, retreat the target units, uh, apply additional numerical hits, things like that. Follow that sequence for um, that barrage. It may be the case then that the units that you're barraging have been forced to retreat. Uh, here are the, here we go, um, here are the rules for retreat and advance after fire support as well. So there are retreat priorities. I think this is a great aspect of the rules. You have to follow these priorities. So units will, here's the example here, units will prioritize retreating by road. You don't get a free say to retreat into a nice terrain hex. They will want to retreat by roads, um, not adjacent to enemy units, things like this. Follow that, that priority. 
Um, yeah, priorities, some units can't retreat. And then, of course, if they vacate that hex due to that fire support, uh, attacking the attacking player can advance any or all adjacent attack designated units into that target hex. So you can get an advance after a fire support mission, before the combat resolution even takes place. Each time you conduct artillery fire support, you must make an ammunition depletion check, rolling a d10, applying the modifiers. Um, on hand supply, I'll talk about in the next video, but basically you deplete any artillery with on hand supply that participated. So they've used whatever supply they had available, they're now out of supply and they'll need to be replenished by reforging supply chains. Um, yeah, that's fire support. As I said, it is six pages long. That's your principally artillery, but also naval gunfire support in some titles, air support in some scenarios. Principally artillery, though. Missions are broken down into volleys, which apply modifiers, which cause artillery shifts and numerical hits, which are resolved uh, via that, that sequence. From there, we move to the attacker status adjustment segment of the combat phase. And this is basically where sometimes you'll have to remove uh, prepared attack markers or, or designators. Sometimes you can voluntarily remove these or a combination of the two. And this may be because you have um, markers that are no longer valid or you've accidentally designated too many or, yeah, you'll have to remove those because there are limitations to the number of ground assaults you can make in a turn based on the, I feel like I'm gonna get this wrong. I think it's the ammunition depletion value of the headquarters. I'll cover that later, but basically keep in mind at this stage that there are limits to the attacks, the number of attacks you can make with a in a formation. Okay, so you'll need to be mindful of, of that and some of those restrictions. Um, I'm sure it's covered probably in the mandatory removal. Uh, not adjacent. Yeah, ammunition depletion value. You can't launch more ground assaults than allowed by the ammunition depletion value limits covered later in the rulebook, which I'll talk about in the next video, but be mindful of that for now. Then we get to the, the main part, and this is actually relatively straightforward. It's lengthy, but pretty clear. The rules are really well written here. Uh, ground assault. So you can use the ground assault table. Now, Wacht Amrain comes with this ground assault table which looks really messy and chaotic when I first looked at this I was like oh my goodness what is going on here Atlantic Wall comes with a similar table that is sort of broken down and looks a lot clearer and excuse my photocopy uh, it's not great with color but the original Atlantic Wall looks really cool so again if you can get a copy of that revised table it looks a lot clearer than the one that comes with locked um Rhine. how does this work the table is split into two sections, a left and a right. The right side is basically beneficial to, if you can get these odds, high odds, it is generally more beneficial to the attacker. The left side, if you can't quite get high enough odds, it is generally beneficial to the defender. The defender will generally cause heavier casualties on the attacker. Bear that in mind. So you want to try to, try to get, if you're the attacker, you want to try to get to the right hand side of um, that column. The rules outline the steps you take. You identify the defender's hex, um, uh, determine the terrain. So the defender chooses the terrain they're defending in. They obviously generally will want to pick the best def uh, terrain as possible. You identify the attacking hexes and again, um, prepared assaults can be can combine. Tactical assaults can only one on one. As summarized here. There you check attacker restrictions here. Um, you check uh, constricted terrain and the limitations on units that can participate. That's a very important limit, uh, limitation, particularly in Wakdam Run, where there's a lot of that constricted terrain. You uh, work through a quick um, determine units, unit status segment. This can be surrender checks if units are isolated out of supply. It can be standoff if units can't, uh, basically um, armoured units that can't get into the uh, area. Um, they can fulfil this sort of standoff role. 
uh, declare use of on hand supply, markers out of supply, any that use that, restrictions on night turns, and consideration of defenders that are in the hex that have previously retreated. Um, Checking for Haya Bridge Demolition, Hasty Bridge Demolition. I won't run through that, but just be mindful that if the defender determines if a bridge may be subject, they can attempt to hastily uh, demolish that. Then you determine the ground assault value. Various modifiers for things like um, leg units attacking across the river. Um, what else? Uh, units out of supply or fatigued. Standoff mode, quartering if it meets multiple conditions, things like that. Not a lot, they won't apply too often. Same for the defender, you apply their combat strength modifiers. Then, oh, this is just the explanation for um, the requirements for combined arms. Uh, otherwise, you suffer that um, pure AFE halving of their combat strength. You then determine the ground assault value ratio. In effect, combat odds ratio. Attacker divided by defender, determine the column, determine column shifts. And again, there are quite a few column shifts that apply as detailed through here. And again, I won't summarize all of these. There's quite a lot to run through. Keep an eye on all of those. Again, defender shifts, there's an almost equal number. Um, modifiers, what else? Modifiers for having adjacent defenders, which can help. There are modifiers for having engineers, which um, negate defensive modifiers against for, for defensive works. They negate those modifiers. There are modifiers for, oh, commandos can serve a similar purpose to engineers. So as you read through the engineer section, you then read about engineers, uh, command, commandos, and they do a similar thing. You then determine dice roll modifiers for the combat by adding and subtracting all of these. Um, and these are big modifiers. There are, um, Bonuses for uh, proficiency rating, combat reserve, regimental integrity. Again, I'm not going to go through all of these. Basically, they all add bonuses. And the bonuses are usually five dice roll modifiers. They all add up. So there's a lot of sort of note taking here on one bonus here, one bonus there. Regimental integrity bonuses can apply. Armor bonuses are quite complicated. <sighs> and variable. So there are various types of modifiers that may apply. I'm not going to go through all of these, but basically what you're doing is you're comparing the attacking armor bonus against the defender armor or AT bonus. You're working out which one is higher. If if one is, <laughs> you work out which one's higher, you subtract the lower one. Um, various modifiers apply to that difference um, which are summarized throughout here, and that may result in additional bonuses which convert to additional die roll modifiers. You add up all those different die roll modifiers to get a, a positive or negative up to 60, and you apply that to the die roll that you make on the combat results table or aka the ground assault table with your final sort of column designated. You then roll the die. Apply those dice roll modifiers. Determine the result. Now, when I say roll the die, you roll the dice. It's a D100 system. So you'll be rolling 30, for example. Um, plus or minus 40 gives you a result of, for example, 70 on the four to one column line four. Um, using uh, the original table as an example. So if I'm using four to one, Line four, if I go to 70, I'm looking here, that's an asterisk one result. I'll talk about the results in, in just a moment. Basically, you do that for both uh, attacker and defender to get results. The attacker die roll, uh, four to one, 70, gives this result against the defender. The defender rolls and gets a result against the attacker. So, look, that sounds like a lot. It's very kind of procedural. The rules here are very clear. It's just very extensive. There's a lot to go through. Determining what units can participate, what column shifts apply, uh, what bonuses then apply, how those bonuses convert 
to um, die roll modifiers. The die roll modifiers can be variable. So for example, if you have a lot of armor factors being brought, those bonuses can be worth 15 die roll modifiers each instead of just a regular five for most other things. Once you've done that, you, uh, you've rolled the dice, you've determined the results for attacker and defender, you apply the results. The attacking player determines their results and applies theirs first and then the defending player. The asterisk is a mandatory proficiency rating check. It can cause additional discretionary hits if you fail. Then you resolve um, mandatory hits first. Now these are principally um, uh, suffering step losses. You'd have to take them from the lead unit first. Max, so one thing to keep in mind is max step losses. And this is basically each unit can suffer a max, at most one step loss in a combat. And you have to distribute those evenly throughout all the units. Once you've done that, you can get to these discretionary hits. And this is where you have a, little, a, few, a few options. The rules will run through the type of options you have for applying these hits. You can attempt to hold your position by attempting to pass a proficiency rating. You can decide to conduct a limited retreat. You can conduct a full uh, retreat. Um, and yeah, the, 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 the distance of your retreat helps satisfy those discretionary hits. There are details here on retreat procedures. And again, there are priorities for retreat. There are uh, limitations on max retreat distances. And so you have to kind of balance up the the number of hits you have to suffer with how far you can actually retreat. Um, as I said, priorities here, uh, you may retreat into other forces and uh, penalties for uh, retreating adjacent enemy units and some units can't retreat. You have to check for bridge collapse using, of course, that uh, I spoke about this earlier, the bridge limitation check and then you can have advance after combat. Now, advance after combat is, um, yeah, relatively, it's interesting and, and not too um, unusual. You basically have to follow kind of the first, you advance is the hex and follow the path of a retreat generally, but there are various um, situations where you can break from that advance path. Um, so mech units can deviate if all hexes entered are clear or connected by a road, so they can kind of follow a road away. Um, if the um, defenders were eliminated at some point, you have to kind of basically start to follow their point of retreat until they were eliminated, and then you can branch away. Um, there are restrictions, particularly mech units must stop upon entering particular types of terrain, um, unless it's along a road. Restrictions on moving adjacent to enemy forts, mud restrictions, night turn restrictions, and of course, fuel restrictions. And the final step in this combat sequence is the removal of those artillery shift markers. So they only apply for that combat phase, and then they're removed. That is combat. We're up to page 50. Um, so bringing this all together, pay attention to the rules for artillery missions, volleys, modifiers for combat. The, I found the AT rules, the, the armor AT rules, uh, quite lengthy. Um, so read through those carefully and think about the, the, I think there are four different situations that you need to think about, whether there's armor versus AT, AT versus AT, armor versus armor, or something like that. Um, and then, yes, the various modifiers that apply, um, the, the mandatory and discretionary hits rules, um, Pass through those carefully. Once we've done that, we get through to the... Actually, I'll cover fatigue very briefly here. So units can suffer um, fatigue as a result of those uh, discretionary hits. Um, they are designated by little fatigue markers which impact their abilities. So you can see with the fatigue 1 marker, the movement allowance is halved, combat strength is halved with fatigue 2, the movement and combat strength is quartered. Um, there are various other modifiers, uh, various other restrictions on being fatigued summarized here. So they, what else? They can't do certain things. Fatigue 2, can't enter PA mode, can't be attack designated, can't participate in fire support missions, things like that. And then if we can recover during the fatigue recovery segment of a friendly administrative phase. And this, yeah, this happens as a result of combat and it impacts their ability to engage in combat, among other things. 
So I just thought I'd mention that as a postscript to, to combat. We then get into supply and I'll cover supply and pretty much most of the rest of the rules in a video. I won't be going in detail over supply, I'll be skimming over it. There's basically 20, page, 20 plus pages of supply and trucks and fortifications and I'll just kind of very quickly skim. But because at, at this point here, we have enough to start with a lot of the smaller scenarios. You don't need to know about supply. Well, you don't need to know the details of supply and headquarters and fuel and ammunition to get started with some of the early scenarios. So at that point, we know about, well, unit information, movement, um, attack designation, fire support and combat. And you can, yeah, really jump into some of those early scenarios. As always, I hope that's been helpful. Thanks, everyone, and take care.